Village of Glendale Heights, celebrating our past, creating our future. Hello everyone, I am Village President Linda Jackson. It gives me great pleasure to narrate the history of our community, one that is full of exceptional people, stories, events, and achievements. Before I begin, I would like to recognize the members of the Glendale Heights Historical Committee who are dedicated to the preservation of the rich heritage and history of our community for future generations. They have worked tirelessly and devoted their time and effort into gathering the information that is contained in this presentation. In 2012, the DuPage County Historical Society honored the Glendale Heights Historical Committee with a History Recognition Award for all they have accomplished over the past 15 years. During our time together, we will talk about the very first pioneer families who settled on our land in the 1800s and the remnants of their homesteads that are still in existence. We'll also look back at who incorporated our village in 1959 and the many people over the years who have contributed to bringing the village of Glendale Heights to where it is today. I hope you take the time to sit back and enjoy. There have been many books written about the history of the state of Illinois, DuPage County, and our townships. Each tell us stories about the adventurous pioneer families who arrived in the 1800s and established the first settlements. Illinois became the 21st state in 1818 with a population of only 34,620, about the same population of Glendale Heights today. Most of the settlers lived in the southern part of the state. By 1830, the population had grown to over 157,000, and by 1860, there was close to 1.8 million people living in the state. These pioneers transformed Illinois into the fastest growing territory in the United States in the 1800s. The rich soil found in the prairies, the many rivers, and the large groves of wooded areas is what attracted the pioneers to the state of Illinois. Some of these early settlers purchased land that would someday become the village of Glendale Heights. Most of the settlers that came to our area were from the eastern United States. They traveled for many weeks in covered wagons pulled by ox teams to reach their destinations. The federal government owned most of the land in the state and allowed the settlers to lay claim to the land that would later be purchased for $1.25 per acre. When the settlers arrived, they encountered Native Americans living along the DuPage rivers. The Native Americans were generally friendly to the new settlers as they began to carry on extensive trade. That was not the case with Chief Blackhawk, who, in 1832, led 1,000 Native American warriors across the Mississippi River at Rock Island. The invasion was an attempt to reclaim land that had been previously sold to the United States government. Along their route in northern Illinois into Wisconsin, the Native Americans massacred the settlers, killed their livestock, and burned the settlements to the ground. Suddenly, the peace and prosperity in the new settlements turned into scenes of fear, distress, and poverty. One-third of the United States Army and 9,000 Illinois militiamen were called into service against Black Hawk. United States General Winfield Scott commanded a troop of soldiers that marched west from Chicago on what was then the old Winnebago Trail. This army route is what gave Army Trail Road its name. Black Hawk Elementary School, located in Glendale Heights on Army Trail Road, was also named for this war. The Black Hawk War ended in August of 1832, and a treaty extinguished the remaining Native American land in the territory 
that set the stage for growth in DuPage County. DuPage County was established a few years later on February 9, 1839 and was named after a French fur trapper. The 1840 census recorded a population of DuPage County of only 3,535. By 1900, the population had grown to 28,198. Captain Joseph Naper was the founding father of DuPage County and also of the first town in the county, which was Naperville. DuPage County was then divided into nine townships. Glendale Heights is located in two of these original townships, Bloomingdale and Milton. In 1833, the first settlers arrived in Bloomingdale Township and established a settlement later to become known as Bloomingdale. Bloomingdale was the first village platted in the township in 1845 and it was officially incorporated in 1889. Lake Street, that runs through Bloomingdale, was a popular stagecoach route. The stagecoach traveled at the rate of six miles per hour with a team of four horses. Passengers paid five to six cents a mile for the ride. In Milton Township, Moses, Stacy, and his family arrived in 1835 and established the town of Stacy's Corner. This town later became part of the village of Glen Ellen. In 1846, Moses Stacy opened a wayside inn and tavern for stagecoach travelers moving between Chicago and Galena. For 50 cents, guests could stay overnight, which included two meals and enough hay for two horses. Stacy's Tavern was added to the National Register of Historic Places. It is the only tavern in the state of Illinois standing on its original foundation at its original location and is now open as a public museum. Reverend Milton Smith was only 25 years old when he arrived in DuPage County in 1835. Reverend Smith and his wife Abigail had five children. He was one of the founders of the Wesleyan Methodist Church in Wheaton and also one of their early pastors. Milton Smith purchased land to build a house on Bloomingdale Road just north of North Avenue that would later become part of the village of Glendale Heights. Milton shared the views of many other early settlers in DuPage County that were against slavery. In his book, The History of DuPage County, Illinois, written in 1882, Rufus Blanchard lists Milton Smith as an active abolitionist and says that he had a station of the Underground Railroad at his home in Bloomingdale Township. Gilbert Way purchased 80 acres of land and established his homestead in June of 1837 on land that would also become part of the village of Glendale Heights. On April 27, 1840, at the age of 25, Gilbert married his 20-year-old sweetheart, Harriet Fish. Their wedding was the first to be held at Stacy's Corner. The newlyweds moved into their new house that was built in 1840 and began their life together on the farm. Gilbert and Harriet had four children of their own, plus two adopted children. Their oldest son, Edmund, served three years in the United States Union Cavalry during the Civil War. In 1953, a journal, along with letters that belonged to Gilbert Way, were discovered under the floorboards of the house and later turned over to the Glen Ellen Historical Society. In this Daily Herald newspaper article, it was reported that the ledger provided a treasure trove of information about the farmer's business transactions. More recently, in 2015, a letter from a Civil War lieutenant dated March 8, 1865, was discovered in the house. The letter was from Harriet Way's brother, George. He gives an account of his current military service and expressed, most of all, how much he missed home and his family. 
Our research indicates that both Edmund and George made it home safely at the end of the Civil War. The Way House is still standing today on the same property on Glen Ellen Road, just south of Armitage Avenue. It has had several additions added onto it over the years, but the original house is still there. In 1842, Hiram Patrick came to DuPage County from New York and purchased 760 acres of land located on Bloomingdale Road. A story of a pioneer farm that was written by Ruth Patrick gives a very detailed account of their lives. She begins, The pioneer looked toward the horizon and beheld a high rolling prairie. Nestled in the depressions were occasional ponds of clear water. Bright flowers mingled with the coarse grass, relieving the monotony with brilliant color. This was the land. The Patricks built a new house on the property in 1860 that replaced their original log cabin. A portion of this house is also still standing today, but was moved to a lot on Glen Ellen Road next to the original Way House. Harvey Coe arrived in 1843 and owned 370 acres of land on both sides of Glen Ellen Road. The 1874 Atlas and History of DuPage County describes the Coe homestead handsomely situated, in fact, one of the very finest places in northern Illinois and best neighborhoods in DuPage County. Mr. Coe was a wheat farmer and later began to deal in cattle. Harvey Coe also served as the Bloomingdale Township Assessor in 1851. In the early 1900s, the farm was sold to Allen and Fanny Chrysler, who lived on the farm with their four daughters. The youngest daughter, Amy E. Chrysler, lived on the farm almost her entire life. Amy wrote the original History of Glendale Heights that appears in the book DuPage Roots, by Richard A. Thompson. Her writings have served as a resource for this video. Roland Rathbun and his family were also from New York and arrived in 1844. They purchased 120 acres on the east side of Glen Ellen Road and established their homestead. The Rathbuns were dairy farmers and ran their dairy business in the area for many years. Roland was also very active in county and township affairs. He served as the Bloomingdale Township Highway Commissioner in 1852 and 1853. Roland had a total of 10 children, and the family continued to live in the area for a long time. In fact, descendants of the Rathbun family still live in Glendale Heights today. The Forest Preserve District of DuPage County now owns all of the Rathbun property. The big red barn that you see on the east side of Glen Ellen Road is the only remaining remnant of their old homestead. Meet the Brackmans, who purchased a farm on the east side of Glen Ellen Road in 1882 and built their farmhouse in 1891. Members of the Brackman family lived on this farm for almost 80 years and the descendants of this family also still live in Glendale Heights today. The original Brackman farmhouse is still standing today at 1440 Circle Drive and later became the first Glendale Heights Village Hall. Is that road in our village pronounced Schmail or Schmally? The great-grandson of the original Schmail family, Dr. John Schmail, and his wife Joyce confirmed that the correct pronunciation is Schmail. We are grateful to John for sharing his photographs and memories with the village. John's great-grandparents, Johann H. and Dorothea Schmail, together with their two young sons, were immigrants to the United States from Germany in 1866. This photograph was taken on the front porch of the new farmhouse they built on their property. 
In 1877, they purchased 280 acres on the east side of what is now Schmale Road. This area of the county was rich in German ethnic families, and the majority of the families spoke German. They were one of the families that founded St. John's Lutheran Church in Wheaton. Four generations of the Schmale family continued to live and farm the land for the next 100 years. This is the reason the road was eventually named for them. John Schmale informed us that in this era, the family farms were self-sustaining. While each farm family produced their own eggs, milk, vegetables, and butchered for their own meat, harvesting grain was more of a community effort, and the adjoining farmers formed a threshing ring. When the wheat was ripe, it was cut and bundled. The threshing machine would separate the grain from the straw. These pioneer families, together with many others, were the very first settlers on the land that would someday become the village of Glendale Heights. What was the life like for these early settlers in the 1800s? First, educating children was very important. This one-room Queen Bee schoolhouse was built on Bloomingdale Road around 1860 on land donated by a farmer. The schoolhouse had two wooden outhouses and a hand pump outside the front door. Heat was provided by a wood-burning stove that was later converted to oil burning. The schoolhouse held classes for up to 20 students, ages 7 to 21. Teachers in those days earned from $1.50 to $3 per week. If there were not a sufficient number of students or no teacher, the school would be closed and the children bused to other nearby schools. History tells us that Queen Bee got its name in 1896 when the one-room schoolhouse was infested with a beehive and school had to be discontinued until they were able to locate the queen bee that was living behind the walls. The schoolhouse existed on the same property for at least 100 years. Miss Sarah McGlenn was a teacher there in the 1920s. Our own Annie Rathbund, who grew up on the Rathbund farm, was a graduate of Wheaton College. She taught in the one-room schoolhouse between 1932 and 1938. This photograph, taken on January 28, 1938, is Annie in the classroom with her students, who also lived and grew up on the area farms that we talked about earlier. The Marquardt Schoolhouse, built in 1893, was located at the corner of Army Trail Road and Glen Ellen Road. This schoolhouse was also a simple one-room, wood frame building. As the story goes, some of the farmers were not in favor of the location of the schoolhouse, and they would bring their teams of horses over on a weekend and move the schoolhouse to a more convenient location for their children to attend. Obviously, that upset other farmers who would move it back to where it belonged. The one-room schoolhouse served the Marquardt School District for 45 years. It was replaced with a red brick building in 1938. In this class photo from 1942, there was still only one teacher that taught all eight grades. Glenbard West was the first high school in District 87, built in 1922. The coming of the railroads in the mid-1800s brought about significant changes to the settlers by offering a much faster means of transportation for the shipment of milk, cattle, and crops to markets outside of Chicago. The settlers used their political influence to have the railroad tracks routed through their farms and towns and donated needed land at no cost or even pay cash to have the rail line available to them. The coming of the railroads also brought about the incorporation of many of our neighboring communities in the late 1800s, including Lombard, Roselle, Glen Ellen, and Wheaton. 
The Great Western Rail Line, located on the far south side of the village of Plundell Heights, was built in 1887 and is now the Great Western Trail. And the original Illinois Central Railroad that runs through the center of our village was opened for service between 1888 and 1889 and is still in operation today. This railway originally offered both passenger and freight service for milk and other products from the area farmers. Glendale Heights Historic House, originally located on Bloomingdale Road, was built on property adjacent to this new railroad line in 1888 and was home to several farm families for 75 years. The growth of the railroads in the postal system set the stage for the mail order business. Sears Roebuck and Company published their first catalog in 1894. These old catalogs provide an excellent resource for understanding the lifestyle at the turn of the century. From horse carriages to household appliances and furnishings, clothing styles, and a wide variety of items that were available, including the popular new convenience of the telephone. There was usually one telephone available at the general store that all the nearby farmers could use for 25 cents. A private telephone in the home was rare for many years. After the turn of the century, lifestyles again changed as natural gas and electricity came to DuPage County. Soon after, public water and sewer systems were established, and very slowly, the farmers began to bring their plumbing indoors. Volunteer fire departments were established in the early 1900s, including one in Bloomingdale. The greatest invention of the 1900s was the horseless carriage. It began to make its appearance in DuPage County around 1903. This picture, from the story of Old Town Glen Ellen, was reportedly the first automobile in town. Automobiles were common enough for Bloomingdale to pass an ordinance establishing a speed limit of 8 miles per hour on streets, and drivers were required to sound a bell at every street crossing. And of course, automobile repair garages followed shortly behind. By 1920, most people were beginning to purchase cars, and the old dirt and plank roads were starting to be paved as a result of the automobile. Filling stations, as they were called back then, were beginning to appear along the highways. Roosevelt Road was the first two-lane paved road in 1920. Lake Street was paved next in 1922. The miracle of the home radio was also introduced in the early 1920s and would remain the means of news and entertainment in the household for the next 25 years. Meet the Bear family. They purchased a 73-acre farm in 1920 and lived in what is now the Glendale Heights Historic House. The Bears primarily raised chickens on the farm and sold them to McChesney's Grocery Store in Glen Ellen. Descendants of the Bear family, now living in Wheaton, are excited that the village restored their old family farmhouse and have provided the village with a lot of information about our historic house and the family that once lived there. North Avenue was paved through DuPage County between 1928 and 1933 as one of the Great Depression's New Deal programs initiated under President Franklin D. Roosevelt. The original Kai's Tavern and Restaurant was established the following year in 1934. A portion of the building that you see in this picture is still part of the restaurant today. The early 1940s were dominated by World War II. The returning GIs after the war ended created the baby boom in 1946. In the late 1940s, television was introduced to American homes and became the new mass media in black and white. By the early 1950s, black and white broadcasts gave way to color. Overall, 
DuPage County and its incorporated communities experienced significant growth during the first half of the 20th century, reaching over 150,000 residents by 1950. In 1951, Robert Bartlett purchased and subdivided land on the north side of North Avenue that was called the Glen Ellen Countryside Subdivision. The little one-room Queen Bee Schoolhouse was no longer big enough to handle all the new children moving into the area, and the school district did not have much money. Every Saturday and Sunday, many men in the neighborhood gathered at the school and slaved away at an addition with two indoor bathrooms and a furnace. The school could now accommodate 30 students. In just two more years, a second addition was needed and a second teacher was hired. By the end of the 1950s, several new highways were built to get from one place to another quickly that created ideal places for new towns. The farmland, commonly referred to as Cloverdale, situated between the village of Bloomingdale on the north and Glen Ellen on the south, was ripe for new development. Midland Enterprises, owned by Charles G. Ruskin and his son Harold, set their sights on this land for a new town. The Ruskins were among the highest volume builders in the post-war housing boom. The name Harold A. Ruskin is well documented in our history. Harold is featured in the book, DuPage at 150, and Those Who Shaped Our World, written by Jean Moore and Hiawatha Bray. There have been numerous other newspaper publications written about him, but Harold Ruskin is best known as the founding father of the village of Glendale Heights. He was born in Chicago in 1929. At age 13, he launched his first enterprise, a landscaping business, and had 10 other kids working for him. At age 18, he worked as a construction laborer and cement finisher, and at age 20, he went into business for himself as an independent contractor. Harold graduated with a law degree from DePaul University and was admitted to the Illinois Bar Association, although he was never a practicing attorney. Harold was drafted to serve in the United States Army in 1953 during the Korean War and served in the Intelligence Division. Harold became a self-made multi-millionaire primarily as a result of real estate development. One of his early partnerships in the mid-1950s was with Ray Kroc, the founder of McDonald's Corporation. Together they built the first 30 McDonald's buildings nationwide. Ruskin later broke with crack and returned to home building. Harold married Merle on October 28, 1955, after meeting her on a blind date. Merle was a graduate of the American Academy of Dramatic Arts and became an actress and a singer with an extraordinary voice. She performed on television and on Broadway and was part of the cast for the production of South Pacific. She gave up her career as an actress after she married Harold and devoted herself to her family. They had two children, Jim and Leslie, and later several grandchildren. In 1992, Harold Ruskin donated $2 million to DePaul University Theater School and in return requested the old Blackstone Theater in Chicago be renamed for his wife, the Merle Ruskin Theater. For leisure activity, he enjoyed big game hunting in India, Hawaii, and Alaska, and became an avid polo player, which he termed a narcotic sport. In 1958, Harold purchased 1,500 acres of farmland for about $1,500 per acre, a huge increase from the $1.25 per acre the original settlers paid 100 years before. These first land purchases included the original Co farm and the Brockman farm. In 1959, Harold Ruskin built a cluster of 25 new homes on 25 acres along Glen Ellen Road and Fullerton Avenue. He began renting and selling the new houses to his employees. 
On June 16, 1959, Harold Ruskin filed a petition with DuPage County to call for the question on incorporation. There were 40 votes cast, 28 yes, 11 no, and one spoiled ballot. The judge ruled the election passed and the territory was officially incorporated on July 13, 1959 as the village of Glendale with a population of 104 residents. The town was named Glendale because it's situated between Glen Ellen and Bloomingdale. Shortly after incorporation, it was discovered that there was already another town in southern Illinois named Glendale. Ruskin tried to buy the name from the other town, but it was refused. Heights was later added on June 9, 1960. Heights describes the unique topography of the village as it rests on two distinct elevations with a 100-foot variation. The first special village election was held on August 22, 1959. While it was an uncontested election ballot for a village president, clerk, six trustees, and a police magistrate, there were some write-in candidates that challenged the vote. Most of the candidates were employees of Harold Reskin. Anthony Leary, who became the first village president, was Harold's roofing contractor. The first meeting of the new village board was held on September 1, 1959, at the home of the newly elected village president. The very first ordinance that was passed was to adopt a building code. The first houses built by H.A. Ruskin Builders were on Larry Lane, named after the first village president, Charles Drive, named after Charles Ruskin, and Harold Avenue, named after Harold Ruskin. The model houses were built on James Court, named after Harold's son, closer to North Avenue, where the Midland Enterprises offices were located. To attract people to the new town of Glendale Heights, Midland Enterprises ran an advertisement for a giveaway of two new homes. The houses were being sold for about $12,000 to $13,000. The small new village was totally dependent on Harold Ruskin for the first few years. Reskin literally owned every square inch of the village and controlled everything, including the Glen Ellen Utility Company that provided the water and sewer system for village residents. Reskin had to advance building permit fees to enable the village to meet its financial obligations. The first revenue and expense report shows that the village had $323.10 in the bank. These newspaper articles from 1960 are about the one and only police officer, Thomas Proudfoot. The village president suspended Proudfoot for his insubordination, leaving the village without police protection. There is another article describing a want ad for a police officer, stating the only qualification is to stay awake 24 hours a day, weeks on end. The village resolved its crisis by hiring three part-time officers. The article went on to say that they would not wear uniforms and the village was spending $400 for special radio equipment between their homes and the squad cars. On April 18, 1961, a regular election for village officials was held. This election had two slates of candidates, one known as better government candidates and the other independent progressive candidates. Voters gave the better government candidates a clean sweep victory by a margin of two to one, and the young village welcomed their new community leaders. Throughout the early 1960s, the village continued to grow, but remained a primarily residential community. The federal census of 1960 recorded a population of 175 but by 1962, the population had grown to 2020, with more new houses being built south of Armitage Avenue along Glen Ellen Road, Divine Drive, Easy Street, and Leslie Lane. The growing population in the 1960s brought about significant demands for new schools. St. Matthew Catholic Church and School broke ground for their new building in 1960 on land that was donated by Harold Reskin. 
The building was completed the next year and the first mass was held in March of 1961. And the school opened September of 1961. In 1960, Lombard East High School in Lombard was completed. G. Stanley Hall School was the first public elementary school in District 15 that was built in 1961. Followed by the third addition to the Queen Bee Elementary School in District 16 that was built in 1962. That resulted in the demolition of the original one-room schoolhouse. Charles G. Ruskin School was built in 1964, followed by Glen Hill and Americana. Glenside Junior High School, now known as Glenside Middle School, was built in 1966. And Glenbard North High School opened in Carroll Stream in 1968. For the first five years, village officers were housed in various buildings owned by Ruskin. In 1964, Ruskin leased the old Brockman farmhouse to the village for $1 a month. In this newspaper picture, Harold Ruskin is handing over the keys to village president Carl Westbrook. Finally, the village had a place to call its own. By 1964, the village's police protection was in good hands under a new full-time police chief, Mr. Daniel Herrera, Jr. Daniel moved into the village in 1960 and shortly thereafter started working as a part-time police officer. Because of his previous military service in the Marine Corps and his experience as an Illinois State Investigator, Daniel quickly moved up the ranks and became the Chief of Police in 1964. Dan has shared a lot of great stories about the village in those early years. He is proud of his personal contributions to bringing much needed training and professionalism to the Glendale Heights Police Department. Daniel shared a 1964 letter from Village President Darlene Clemente that commended Chief Herrera and all of the full-time and part-time officers for their performance in handling all types of police emergencies and situations. The Glendale Heights Library was formed in 1967 by the village, who appointed a three-member library commission. It was located in an 800-square-foot, three-bedroom house on Glen Ellen Road. The library had 2,000 donated books and was operated by the local women's club volunteers. In 1966, the village purchased the North Glen Ellen Utility Company from Harold Ruskin for $2.3 million. The village financed this purchase with the sale of revenue bonds. In 1961, the first shopping center was built at the northwest corner of Glen Ellen Road and North Avenue. It included a National Tea Finer Food grocery store, drug store, Glendale hardware, a laundromat, currency exchange, and a dry cleaner. The village post office branch originally opened in the drug store, but later built a separate building adjacent to the shopping center. The second shopping center was built in 1968 at the southwest corner it included a jewel grocery store and turnstile discount store. Fensel Tufo Chevrolet, now Sunrise Chevrolet, was also established in the late 1960s. In 1966, the village welcomed its first industrial building, the Chicago Blower Company. And in 1969, the first large apartment complex was developed that was originally called Valleywood. Fullerton Avenue, east of Glen Ellen Road. After an unsuccessful attempt to establish a park district in 1966, the village continued to own and maintain its own parks and recreation programs through a parks commission. The Circle Pool and Recreation Center was built in 1968. To wrap up the first decade of the 1960s, 
the last thing the village residents decided they needed was their own fire protection district. In 1969, Glenside Fire Protection District successfully petitioned to disconnect all property south of the Illinois Central Railroad from the Bloomingdale Fire Protection District. In 1970, the new Glenside Fire Station opened with what was then state-of-the-art fire trucks. A few years after graduating from Glenbard Township High School in 1959, Nina left the Schmale Farm to attend nursing school. She installed the old Schmale Road street sign in her bedroom at the townhouse that she shared with other nursing students. Tragically, on July 14, 1966, Nina Jo Schmale, great-granddaughter of the original Schmail settlers, was one of the eight nurses brutally murdered by Richard Specht. Her brother John remembers their walks together when they were young to the one-room Queen Bee schoolhouse carrying their tin lunch pails. He remembers his sister's sense of humor, how she loved Elvis, cats, the color pink, and her 1957 Chevrolet Bel Air convertible in pale yellow. John also established the Nina Jo Schmale Scholarship Fund at Wheaton College and a Facebook page entitled Our Nurses Memorial Association so that his sister and her friends are never forgotten. During the first 10 years following the incorporation, the village had a total of 25 trustees and many streets in our community were named after them. There were six village clerks and six village presidents. Although we don't have a picture of our very first village president, Anthony Leary, he is quoted in this newspaper article in October of 1959 saying that the village has a bright and almost unlimited future ahead of it, but it has a mountain of work which must be and will be accomplished in order to attain its status as a leading village. Carl W. Westberg served as village president for two years. Acting village president Darlene B. Clementi, who served the remaining term of Westberg. William J. Keating, who served about four and a half years. And finally, Edwin S. Zubak, who was elected on May 6, 1969, to bring the village forward into the next decade. The official census of 1970 recorded a total population of 11,406 residents. To kick off the new decade, the village had a contest for a village slogan, Proud and Progressive won. This slogan was created by Mrs. Betty Azar, who lived on Belden Avenue. In 1973, resident Ruth Aguilar handmade the first village flag. A woman's club selected the iris as the official village flower, which you see on our water towers and community signs today. And in 1965, Sunburst Locust was named the official village tree. One of the first major issues the village had to deal with in 1970 was the expansion of the sewage treatment plant because it was overflowing and polluting the east branch of the DuPage River. Once completed, the expansion seems to have served a dual purpose for village employees. A devastating flood in 1972 resulted in the Armitage Ditch becoming a raging death trap for an 11-year-old boy. He and his brothers were floating on inner tubes in the flooded open ditch in Reskin Park when the accident occurred. In spite of a major rescue effort, his body was found five hours later near the sewage treatment plant. Covering the Armitage Ditch became a major issue for the residents, but it would take another 30 years for the project to finally be completed. On a brighter note, right next door to the sewage treatment plant, the village built a new park in 1971 that was then commonly known as the Armitage Park. The park was later renamed Nazzles Park after James Nazzles, 
a resident who was very active in community baseball. In 1972, the village hired its first professional village administrator, Mr. William Kirchhoff. Since then, the village board has worked hard to appoint a professional executive staff team that works closely with the board to manage the day-to-day -day operations of the village. The village offices at 1440 Circle Drive quickly became overcrowded. The Public Works Department was moved to a new building at 1635 Glen Ellen Road, and the village administrative offices moved into space at the Glenside Fire Protection District building. The police department stayed behind at the 1440 Circle Drive farmhouse. There were already much bigger plans for a new civic center complex in the works. In 1972, Harold Ruskin donated 10 acres of land for the new village hall. In exchange, the village board agreed to rezone other land Harold owned to build a high-density apartment complex despite resident opposition. The trade-off backfired when voters defeated a referendum proposal for the new village hall that delayed the project. But eventually, construction began in 1974 at a cost of $1.3 million. Trustee Floyd R. Brown died while holding office in 1974. And a community meeting room in the new village hall, as well as a village street, was named in his memory. The village hall was completed in October of 1975, and all of the village departments moved into their new home including the police department. The very first village board meeting to be held in the new Civic Center Council Chambers occurred on January 6, 1976 with President Zubak presiding. During the 1970s, the village experienced extremely rapid growth. In fact, Glendale Heights was the fastest growing suburb in DuPage County. There were several large residential subdivisions under construction in the mid-1970s, including Glen Hill, Pheasant Ridge, Americana, as well as large apartment complexes, including Stonegate. The village ended the 1970s with a population of 20,928. The need for expanded public services was also growing, particularly for recreation. In 1976, the residents approved a referendum for a new recreation center and swimming pool. The project got underway in 1977, and the sports hub with a brand new pool was completed in 1978. Several new schools were also built in the 1970s to meet the needs of the growing population. Richard Kraft Elementary School opened in 1971 followed by Marquardt Middle School in 1974, Pheasant Ridge School was built in 1975, and Blackhawk Elementary School in 1976, completing all of the nine elementary schools that are in our village today. What was a struggling new village in the 1960s became a proud and progressive village in the 1970s. Mayor Edwin Zubak, who served two full terms, is credited for bringing stability to the local government and for his leadership in launching many new capital projects during his tenure. In his own words, he said that the village board adopted the approach that if you're going to do it, do it right. Other residents who served on the village board during the latter part of the decade were Robert Lippert, who served as the village president for two years. Trustee Philip Arcasada was appointed village president until the next election. And Fred Mellenbrook, who served as the village president for two years. Other village leaders during the 1970s included village clerk Marge Peterson and 14 trustees. It was also during the 1970s that the village officials finally took control of their own village. Harold Ruskin moved his Midland business offices to the old farmhouse still standing on one of the farms he had purchased and painted it purple, his wife Merle's favorite color. 
He started the Glendale Polo Club in 1975 on his Windy Point farm and increasingly spent more time there. On Saturday mornings, he sponsored and personally supervised the Glendale Riding Club. A weekly equestrian program for children and teenagers with cerebral palsy. He ran the program for 15 years and is quoted as saying, it's the most gratifying thing in the world. Harold never left the village he founded and continued to own substantial acres of land in the community. For the first 20 years after incorporation, development in the village was primarily residential and retail commercial, and by 1980 the population reached 23,163. In the 1980s, the development trend changed as several new office and industrial business centers were built. Today, 445 acres of land in our community is home to many light manufacturing and distribution companies. These business parks helped to broaden the tax base of the village as well as offer many employment opportunities for village residents. The growing community lacks sufficient health care services, so the local leaders rallied to build a new hospital in Glendale Heights. Harold Ruskin donated five of the 15 acres of land needed for the new hospital. Construction got underway in 1977, and the new Glendale Heights Community Hospital opened on March 8, 1980. Today, the hospital is known as the Amida Health Adventist Medical Center, Glen Oaks. It has undergone extensive renovations over the years, including its new state-of-the-art emergency department that opened in 2007, and more recently, private inpatient hospital rooms. The successful passage of a $2.4 million bond issue in 1980 allowed the Glenside Public Library to purchase a three-acre site on Fullerton Avenue. Dedication of the new 25,000 square foot building took place on July 10, 1982. The library finally had a permanent home after 15 years of operating in makeshift facilities. On April 18, 1981, a new village president was elected. Jerry Sullivan served two full terms in office. Although the village board was at times in a state of political turmoil during the 1980s, under President Sullivan's leadership, some very important changes took place in the community. First, you might remember that we left the Public Works Department at their small trailer garage on Glen Ellen Road when the new village hall was built in 1975. In 1981, the village was very proud of its first public works garage on Glen Ellen Road that provided much needed space to house their offices, vehicles, and equipment. In 1983, the village obtained a grant to purchase 15 acres of land on the south side of Fullerton Avenue, west of Bloomingdale Road. These 15 acres were part of a larger 64-acre parcel that was partially purchased by the village, with some land being donated by none other than Harold Ruskin. The village board called the land Meadows Park and envisioned it becoming a central community park someday. Although Meadows Park would not be developed for many years, the land was now owned by the village of Glendale Heights and preserved as open space. In 1983, the village also purchased land commonly known as Ward's Nursery for the widening and extension of Fullerton Avenue between Amy Avenue and Bloomingdale Road. For the first time, residents could drive all the way through town on Fullerton Avenue. In 1983, the village held its first Summerfest event at Meadows Park. No one would have imagined at that first event that Summerfest now called Glendale Heights Fest, would grow into the premier event it is today. 
In 1984, the village celebrated the 25th anniversary of its incorporation. President Sullivan cut the four-foot-high birthday cake that was big enough to feed 500 people. By 1984, the police department was again experiencing growing pains. With a force of 35 police officers, plus their 14 civilian personnel, they had outgrown their space on the first floor of the new Civic Center. The solution was to finish the 12,500 square foot basement level of the building. In the early 1980s, the village also added a new gymnasium to the sports hub to expand recreation programs and organized indoor sports. A major development in the mid-1980s was the Glendale Lake Subdivision. This project consisted of single-family homes, townhomes, and apartments on a beautiful and challenging 18-hole golf course designed by Dick Nugent. This development included the extension of President Street between Fullerton Avenue and North Avenue. After a lot of debate, the village purchased the new golf course in 1986, including the trailers that served as the clubhouse. Again, all of the new development in the 1980s brought about the need for another expansion of the sewage treatment plant to comply with the Environmental Protection Agency regulations. The cost of this project was $10.4 million that was partially funded by a grant. The project was completed in 1987. Following a special population census in 1987, the village declared its home rule status, and in 1988, the village residents voted to approve a district form of government that divided the village into six election districts. There were a total of 10 village trustees that served the community at large between 1980 and 1988. The election in 1989 brought in the 11th village president, Michael S. Camera, and six newly elected district trustees. Three village clerks served in office in the 1980s. The village's rapid growth and development was finally slowing down. In 1990, the population of the village had reached 27,973. The election in 1991 brought three new trustees to the village board, including a newcomer, me, Linda Jackson. It is hard for me to believe that I have served on the village board for over 25 years. At the top of the list of new projects in 1990 was Safety Town, an outdoor miniature replica of the village that is used to teach safety awareness to children ages 5 to 7. Safety Town was completed and dedicated in 1991, and the village later received a Governor's Hometown Award for Safety Town in 2001. In 1992, after years of planning and water system upgrades, the village finally received Lake Michigan water. The sudden death of village president Mike Camera on April 8, 1994, led to trustee Ben Fajardo being appointed acting village president. Ben was elected the village president in 1995 and worked very hard at creating a village board that could work together. This newfound cooperation on the Village Board led to many capital projects in the mid-1990s. First, it was time to build a new clubhouse at the Glendale Lakes Golf Course. The project was completed in 1995 and boasted a golf shop, small bar, and three banquet rooms that can serve up to 250 people. This public golf course and clubhouse is considered a premier facility in our community today. In 1996 and 1997, the Village Board agreed to move forward with a $16 million bond issue to complete several other long-awaited capital projects. 
Meadows Park, that was purchased back in 1983, would finally be developed. After completion, the new park was dedicated in memory of Village President Michael S. Cameron. 1.6 acres of land was purchased and developed for a new park on Dunham and Drive and was later named Millennium Park and dedicated in memory of Village President J. Ben Fajardo. A new Public Works Administration building and garage was completed and dedicated on September 6, 1997 in memory of Sam Angeletti, an employee who died tragically while on duty. Water and sewer improvements were extended on North Avenue in conjunction with the widening of North Avenue to a six-lane roadway. A 500,000-gallon water tank was also completed in the fall of 1996 to improve water delivery to our community. A third addition was added to the sports hub, consisting of a new multi-purpose gymnasium and indoor soccer field. The pool that was built in 1976 was now over 20 years old and was replaced with a new aquatic park that was completed in 1997. An addition made to the Civic Center in 1998 was the first addition since the building was built in 1975. The project included both a first floor and a second floor addition used for administrative offices. The last major project that was completed with the bond issue was the enclosure of Armitage Ditch, a project that had been talked about in the village for over 30 years. In 1996, Harold Breskin died after a long battle with cancer. His father, Charles, died later that same year. After his death, Harold's wife, Merle, informed officials that Harold wanted to donate one more thing to the village he founded and helped to build, which was the old farmhouse that he used for the offices of Midland Enterprises. His polo field was also sold to make room for yet another development consisting of residential housing units and small industrial lots along the railroad. The farmhouse that had to be moved to a different location on the polo fields on land that was donated by Merle Ruskin. The village graciously accepted this last donation from the founder of our village and made plans to restore the house back to its turn-of-the-century charm. Since 1996, the village has been designated as a Tree City USA community and has continued that tradition for 18 years. To qualify as a Tree City, the village must meet standards established by the Arbor Day Foundation and the National Association of State Foresters and have a viable tree management plan and program in place. Currently, the village maintains over 12,000 trees located throughout the community in parks and on parkways. In 1999, the village initiated the Character Counts Coalition in our community. Today, the coalition consists of community members who work together to promote the six pillars, trustworthiness, respect, responsibility, fairness, caring, and citizenship. Ever since, it has become an important tradition in our community to recognize students and individuals that have demonstrated outstanding character. The 1990s ended in sadness with two tragic events. The village grieved the death of trustee Chuck Fonte, who served as a village trustee for 10 years. He was best known for always watching out for the little guy and being true to himself. The gazebo at Camera Park, a banquet room at the Glendale Lakes Clubhouse, and an outside clock on the golf course were all dedicated in his memory. Chuck's wife, Sharon, stepped up to fill in his remaining term of office. Sharon Fonte Sullivan still serves as a trustee and deputy mayor of the village of Glendale Heights. Later that same year, 53-year-old village president J. Ben Fajardo 
suffered a severe stroke that left him disabled and prevented him from ever returning as the village president. He later passed away in 2005. There were a total of 10 trustees that served the village during the 1990s, and one village clerk, Joanne Borzowitz. In July of 1999, the village proudly celebrated its 40th anniversary. To celebrate the first 40 years, the village adopted a new logo and added Village for All People to its motto, Proud and Progressive, to embrace the growing diversity in the community, and adopted an official mission statement that seeks to improve the quality of life to all its residents and commits to serve, protect, and provide a high standard of services and programs. In 2000, the village won its first Governor's Hometown Award for the Christmas Sharing Program. This program was started by village employees many years ago as a way of giving back to their community by helping those in need during the holidays. The continued success of the program would not be possible without the help and generous support from residents, schools, the library, local organizations, and businesses. Last year, the village helped over 100 families with food and holiday gifts. By the year 2000, the population of the village reached 31,765. The new century also brought with it many new challenges and opportunities to community leaders. As a trustee, I served as acting village president during Ben Fajardo's absence and was elected village president in 2001 together with village clerk Joanne Borsowitz and trustees Ed Pope, Sharon Fonte, and Mary Schroeder. The election of 2003 brought three new trustees onto the board, Jim Fiore, Pat Maritato, and Chester Pojack. The attack on America on September 11, 2001 was a day none of us will ever forget. As a community, we mourned and paid tribute to those who lost their lives that day and those that survived through it all. The village welcomed New York firefighter Jim Dahl and his wife to spend a few days in our community. Shortly thereafter, our country was at war in Afghanistan and Iraq. Glendale Heights continues to hold a ceremony on the front steps of Village Hall each year to commemorate Patriots Day. We will never forget. With a renewed sense of patriotism to our country and to those that serve, the village embarked on a plan to build a Veterans Memorial Park. Construction broke ground on Memorial Day 2004 and construction got underway. The park was dedicated on Veterans Day 2004 and a grand opening was held on Memorial Day in 2005. The Vietnam War Memorial was brought to Veterans Park later that year to honor those that it served. All gave some, some gave all. The Illinois Parks and Recreation Association recognized Veterans Park as an outstanding facility and park in the state of Illinois, and the village received a Governor's Hometown Award in 2006. The village is always grateful to our local VFW Post 2377 for their support and participation in events held at Veterans Park. In 2013, the VFW installed a system that plays the powerful taps melody at sunset every evening at the park. The Bloomingdale Fire Protection District was very proud to dedicate their new fire station in July of 2000. This fire district serves all areas of the village north of the railroad tracks. And on July 31, 2004, the Glenside Fire Protection District 
completed work on the expansion of the original fire station built back in 1970. This $3 million state-of-the-art building is expected to serve the residents of the community for many more years to come. Sometimes things that don't happen are just as important to our community as what did happen. In 2004, residents rallied behind their elected officials to oppose the garbage transfer station that was proposed on Fullerton Avenue and Carroll Street. This proposed project was a major threat to the health, safety, and welfare of the residents in Glendale Heights. The grassroots opposition campaign was ultimately successful and the garbage transfer station was denied. We could all breathe a huge sigh of relief. In 2005, the Village Board began a community outreach program that we called Park Parties. This very successful program brings village officials, police officers, firefighters, and our Parks and Recreation Department staff together with food and games out to the community neighborhood parks to meet and greet each other. In 2006, Park Party scored the highest points in its category when it was recognized by the Illinois Parks and Recreation Association as an outstanding community program. The election in 2007 brought one new trustee on the village board, Scott Kyborg. Due to a serious illness, Scott only served one term on the village board and later passed away in 2015. In 2008, we bid farewell to Joanne Borzowitz, who retired after she had served as village clerk for 20 years, and welcomed our new village clerk, Marie Schmidt. A groundbreaking ceremony was held on April 26, 2008, for a long-awaited project, the redevelopment of Reskin Park, one of the oldest parks in the village. The grand reopening celebration was held July 15, 2009. This $2.5 million improvement that was partially funded with a grant is designed for family-oriented recreation and included a new lighted baseball field, a new playground, picnic areas and shelters, walking trails, and other amenities. The old farmhouse that was donated to the village and moved in 2000 desperately needed restoration. Following several fundraising activities by the Historic Committee, restoration of the exterior of the old farmhouse was completed in 2002. The house was dedicated in memory of the village's founding father, Harold A. Reskin, in 2004. Merle Reskin herself was present to cut the ribbon. The village continues to host the annual fishing derby at Lake Becerra, located next to the historic house each year. This event was actually started by our village founder, Harold Reskin, and continues to be a popular family event today. In 2007, the village won its fourth Governor's Hometown Award for the annual Family Health and Safety Fair. This award that gives formal recognition to community programs and most importantly, to volunteers who contributed to their community's quality of life. This free program is supported by numerous organizations and volunteers. It is intended to educate residents on a wide range of issues related to healthy habits, nutrition, fitness, fire safety and firearm awareness, and offers health screening services. Each year, the village also recognizes the Glendale Heights Junior Women's Club. This volunteer organization is credited for helping many young women to become leaders in our community for over 30 years. They conduct fundraising events throughout the year for various causes, including a $2,000 scholarship each year to a female resident headed off to college. Volunteers have long been an invaluable resource to our community 
and every minute of their dedication counts. The Village currently has over 400 registered volunteers and we are always looking for more. Find out how you can make a difference in our community by visiting the Glendale Heights webpage. In 2008, the Village Board signed the Greenest Region Compact, thereby establishing their commitment to go green. As part of this initiative, Glendale Heights launched several community-wide programs, including water conservation and a variety of recycling programs. All of these Go Green efforts led to the village earning its Earth flag in 2009 for its ongoing commitment to the environment. On July 13, 2009, the village reached its 50th anniversary, and we celebrated this milestone all year with Cake for Everyone, an amazing balloon lunch, and everyone's favorite, the commemorative calendar. As part of the 50th anniversary, a grand reopening of the Historic House was held October 11, 2009. Interior work on the Historic House was finally finished to restore its turn-of-the-century charm. The house includes a display area that tells the rich history of our community dating back to the original settlers to the present. By 2009, the Glendale Heights Police Department had grown to a total of 97 personnel, including its 55 sworn officers. The village was very proud of the police department efforts to achieve CALEA accreditation by meeting international standards of excellence. The election of 2009 was unprecedented. It was the very first time in the history of Glendale Heights that there was an uncontested election. And the very first time a village president was re-elected for a third term in office. During the first decade of the new millennium, there were two village clerks and a total of 12 trustees. By 2010, the population of Glendale Heights had reached 34,208, with a lot of the baby boomers now in their 60s, the most significant increase in population were residents 65 years of age and better. The demand for senior citizen services was also increasing. On August 1, 2010, the new Center for Senior Citizens was completed. The seniors finally had a place of their own. Hundreds of seniors from the community attended the grand opening. On its fifth anniversary, the center had approximately 2,000 members. The center boasts a community room, library, game room, arts and crafts room, fitness center, and beauty salon. It also offers a one-stop place for comprehensive senior services, including bus transportation aboard a 14-passenger bus with a wheelchair bus. The mortgage crisis that developed across our nation in 2008, together with the National Recession, had a significant impact on homeowners in Glendale Heights. Hundreds of houses in the village were foreclosed and left abandoned and vacant. Unemployment rates soared and property values continued to decline for the next seven years. Preserving the value of property in our residential neighborhoods is considered one of the most important issues in sustaining a healthy and viable community. The village responded to the crisis by serving as a local resource for homeowners facing foreclosure and also participated in the statewide neighborhood stabilization program to rehabilitate some of the abandoned homes and get them ready for resale. The village also initiated several new community programs, including increased property maintenance code enforcement, 
the Crime Prevention Partnership Program and the Rental Inspection and Licensing Program. In response to the national recession, the federal government offered Build America bonds to help local governments rebuild their communities and get Americans back to work. These bonds offered the village a unique opportunity to borrow money at historically low, subsidized interest rates to implement long-awaited capital projects ahead of schedule. Necessary upgrades to the water pollution control facility were completed to remain in full compliance with all governing regulations. Although not as visible as other public services, the wastewater treatment process is one of the most fundamentally important daily responsibilities of the village. In 2012, the village's Public Works Department was recognized for excellence in sanitary sewer water treatment by the Conservation Foundation. In 2013, the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency awarded the Glendale Heights Water Pollution Control Facility as Plant of the Year. The Glendale Heights Village Hall, that was now over 25 years old, got a much-needed facelift. Interior remodeling included improved access for the residents and new meeting rooms that are available for resident associations to meet. The Glendale Heights motto of a proud and progressive village for all people is prominently displayed as you walk into Village Hall and is a reminder of the stand this hardworking, diverse community takes on welcoming people of all ages, races, and ethnic origin. The renovations to Village Hall also included a building addition for police headquarters that was completed in June of 2012. For the first time in the history of our village, the police department finally moved out of makeshift facilities into an authentic police station that will provide top-notch public safety services to our community for the next 50 years. A 48,000 square foot addition to the sports hub was completed in September of 2013. Together with extensive renovations to the existing sports hub that included remodeling of the fitness center, gymnasiums, field house, and preschool rooms. A grand opening of the expansion to the GH20 Aquatic Center was held on July 4, 2012. This expansion added attractions to appeal to older children. While the little ones can still enjoy the zero depth entrance to the pool and Willie the Whale, the older kids could now enjoy the diving boards, their ride down the flume slides into the plunge pool, and try their skill on the Flow Rider surfing simulator. Today the village owns and maintains 22 parks totaling 254 acres located throughout our community including 20 sports fields and 21 playgrounds, and the 18-hole Glendale Lakes Golf Course. For the past 16 years, the Village, together with its sponsors, hold the annual Charity Golf Classic Golf Outing. This event has raised over $300,000 for various local organizations. Together, we really do make a difference. In 2011, the Village welcomed two new members to the Village Board. Bill Schmidt as District 1 Trustee and Michael Light as District 3 Trustee, together with the re-election of Pat Meritato as District 4 Trustee. The 2013 and 2017 elections resulted in no changes on the Village Board. And together, each of us continue to remain committed to the future of Glendale Heights. I feel very honored and privileged to continue to represent the residents and businesses of our community today. The village of Glendale Heights now offers its residents a wide variety of retail services thanks to our thriving business districts and our local chamber of commerce. 
Each year, we welcome new businesses to our community. Residents can help support our local businesses by shopping in Glendale Heights. Today, the village is financially stable and has an excellent credit rating of AA2. For over 30 years, the village has been awarded a Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. Over the last few years, the village has also been a recipient of a Distinguished Budget Presentation Award. These awards reflect our ongoing commitment to meet the highest standards of financial management, something we consider the cornerstone of good government. Today, our community has been fully developed into the proud and progressive village for all people that was envisioned in 1959. I hope that you have enjoyed this video and that it brought about a better understanding of the history of our community. As you drive around town, perhaps you will notice the old farmhouses that are remnants of the early settlers. For those residents who have lived in the village for a long time, I hope that it brought back some fond memories. For residents that are new to the village, I hope this video helps you feel welcome as you become part of our community. We titled this video, Celebrating Our Past and Creating Our Future, which means that we will all need to keep working together to make our community the best it can be. As we approach the next decade, we want to continue to look back at all of our accomplishments and say with pride, that was then, this is now. Again, I would like to thank the Glendale Heights Historical Committee for making this video possible and their dedication to the preservation of the history of Glendale Heights. Please remember to stop by the Historic House for more information about the history of Glendale Heights. Our history serves as the foundation for our past, defines the character of our present, and helps to guide the development of our future. Having knowledge of who we were and how we progressed to where we are today strengthens our sense of community and lays a path for the journey of what we hope to become. Please join us at our many family events that will be held throughout the year. I look forward to seeing you there.